Okay, seriously, what gives? What's the actual truth about alcohol? Is it a harmless indulgence, a health hazard, or something in between? This is gonna be a deep and personal conversation. Even a little bit of alcohol causes damage in the brain. Researchers at Massachusetts General Hospital say they may be able to explain why light to moderate drinking can actually be good for your heart health. One of the really bad effects of alcohol, it is associated with a significant increase in cancer risk, in particular breast cancer. Let's face it, alcohol is deeply woven into our culture, from celebrations to simple dinners at home. But with all the conflicting reports out there, it's no wonder we're confused. I've always believed in the everything in moderation philosophy. But when it comes to alcohol, what does moderation even mean? And how do you know if that glass of wine is helping you or hurting you, especially when you're handed so many options at restaurants these days, like do you want a six ounce, a nine ounce, or even a 12 ounce pour? And does alcohol really cause cancer? I mean, if that were true, wouldn't they have to put that label on like they do on cigarettes or, you know, like that California Prop 65 notice you see on everything from clothing to furniture? It's a valid question, right? I mean, so many people are afraid of using skincare and hair care products that contain phthalates, parabens, and other toxins. Because we've heard there's a very slight chance of getting cancer. So are we really increasing our risk of getting cancer if we're just having a couple of alcoholic beverages every week? And exactly how much is too much? Okay, today we're cutting through the noise to get to the bottom of what's really going on with alcohol and our health. Because the truth might just surprise you. But before we dive in, let me just say this. I'm not here to preach, judge, or tell you what to do. That's not my style. And it's not my place either, quite frankly. I'm simply gonna share some information I've uncovered through my own research and personal experiences. Information that I wish I had known sooner. So this is gonna be a deep and personal conversation. Okay, let's get into it. I'll start with a little confession. I love wine. Red, white, rosé, depending on the season, the food, or my mood. I like the way it tastes. I like looking forward to having a glass of wine at the end of the day when I can finally relax. I love what I associate it with, you know, connecting with friends, celebrating life's moments, or simply just a nice quiet dinner with my husband. It's kind of become a ritual for many of us. And so much of what we do as a society involves alcohol too. Oh, and by the way, if you're new here, I'm Rena Hedeman, and this is Thrive After 45, where we talk about all kinds of things related to health and wellness for women at midlife and beyond. So if you're a woman who cares about looking phenomenal, feeling fabulous, and aging really well, you should subscribe because not only do I give away my own secrets for aging well, but I also bring you top experts in the field of health, beauty, and fitness for women over 45. <laughs> Truth be told, I'm 60, but some big life changes start to happen around your mid-40s. And I've got some really amazing experts coming soon, so you should definitely subscribe, because trust me, what I've got coming up is phenomenal. Okay, I've got to be honest. Over the years, I've developed a habit of drinking wine in the evening. It's something that basically started when my husband and I lived in London for a few years where wine with dinner is just very much a part of the culture over there. So drinking a glass of red wine almost every night with dinner just kind of became a habit for us. I'm not blaming London or the Brits, obviously, but I do think it's important to understand the excuses we all make that allow these habits to become kind of ingrained. I had to really take a hard look at my habit of drinking wine and examine it objectively. You know, I've always thought it's not a problem. I don't black out, I hold my own, I don't get drunk or mean or lose control, I don't have hangovers. I love the taste. A little bit doesn't hurt. Some say it's actually good for you. These are all the things I've been saying to myself. And yes, they might be actual facts, they are. But they're also excuses dressed up as justifications. But here's the thing. Often what starts out as an occasional treat turns into a habit, a ritual, and it has for me. And I'm not alone in this. So many of us reach for that glass of wine to relax, to de-stress, to mark the end of the day. And for years, we were all told by doctors and health enthusiasts that one glass of red wine each night is actually good for you. So for a long time, I didn't think twice about it. 
I figured, hey, I'm doing everything else right. I eat healthy, I exercise, I take care of my skin. So what's the harm of a little wine? But as I've gotten older, I've started to notice some not so great side effects. I may love wine, but wine doesn't really love me anymore. Many of my besties are saying the same thing. Wine doesn't agree with them anymore. They get headaches or they can't sleep. So some of my friends have switched to tequila drinks or gin and tonics in the summer as their drink of choice. But the huge bummer is, it doesn't really matter what you drink. Alcohol is alcohol. And even if your drink of choice doesn't wreck your sleep or give you brain fog, unfortunately, all alcohol apparently significantly contributes to that little issue of aging faster than we like. It wasn't until I recently really dug into the research that I realized just how much alcohol can impact us and does, especially as we age. And the more I learned, the more I realized that it was time to take a really close look at my own relationship with alcohol and maybe change it. So I wanted to share this with you because the facts I've found in medical and science journals really are quite eye-opening. Okay, first, let's talk about sleep because we all know how crucial it is, especially in midlife when our hormones are already wreaking havoc. I've had those frustrating nights where I'm tossing and turning, wondering why on earth I keep waking up at 3 or 4 a.m. and cannot get back to sleep. It's ironic, isn't it? We reach for that glass of wine thinking it'll help us relax and sleep better, but the reality is quite the opposite. Well, it wasn't until I started reading about the effects of alcohol on sleep that it really clicked for me. Alcohol may help you fall asleep faster, but it seriously messes up with your sleep quality. It's like a bait and switch. I mean, sure, you fall asleep quickly, but then your body spends the rest of the night trying to process the alcohol, which is pretty hard on your body to digest, and that disrupts your sleep cycles. Here's the science behind it. Alcohol suppresses melatonin, which is the hormone that regulates your sleep-wake cycle. It also interferes with your circadian rhythm, which is basically your body's internal clock. And on top of that, alcohol reduces your REM sleep, the phase of sleep that's most restorative. You might even sleep through the night if you're lucky, but you might not wake up feeling rested. Another thing, have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and noticed that your heart's kind of beating faster than it should be when you're sleeping? It's happened to me. Well, that's because alcohol can cause your blood vessels to become narrower. So in order to get enough oxygen through your blood vessels, your heart has to work harder and beat faster. Not easy to fall back to sleep when your heartbeat's pounding away at you. And it's not just about how you feel in the morning either. Poor sleep quality can have a domino effect on your entire day. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. I'm sure you've experienced it. You know, your energy levels, your mood, your ability to focus, and even your appetite. It's all connected. And when your sleep is off, everything else tends to be off too. Now, let's talk about our brains. Did you know that alcohol can actually cause your brain to shrink? I remember the first time I heard that, it just stopped me in my tracks. I thought, wait, what? How can something as common as a nightly glass of wine or a few margaritas over the weekend cause this much damage? I'm guessing you've probably heard of a guy named Andrew Huberman. If you haven't, he's a neuroscientist at Stanford and he really knows his stuff. He's got a podcast called Humorman Lab. I've mentioned him in past videos that I've done. Well, you might have seen or heard about the episode he did on alcohol. Well, if you haven't, in that episode, he was talking about how alcohol impacts the brain. And he mentioned that even what we consider normal drinking can lead to long-term brain damage. And I'm not talking about the kind of damage that's quick or easy to fix. This is permanent. It can lead to cognitive decline, memory issues, and even an increased risk of dementia. And let's get real here. Not only does alcohol cause thinning of the brain, but it also causes brain fog. You know how sometimes you're trying to think of a word and it's right on the tip of your tongue, but you just can't find it? Or you walk into a room and then you suddenly forget why you even went in there in the first place? Happens to me all the time. And I've got to wonder, is this just normal aging? Is it menopause and decreased hormones? Or could it be because of alcohol? And then there's inflammation. 
In past videos, I've talked a lot about inflammation and how important it is to eat a diet that's low in processed foods to figure out what things are toxic to us and to try to minimize those things because it's systemic inflammation that often leads to disease and general health problems. And I, I don't wanna be inflamed on the outside. You know, I don't want the extra puffiness in my face and in my fingers and ankles. And I certainly don't want the damage of inflammation on the inside of my body either. Well, unfortunately, one of the biggest contributors to systemic inflammation is, you guessed it, alcohol. It's not just about the brain either. Alcohol damages every cell in our body. It's water permeable, it's fat permeable, and for that reason, when we drink, it's affecting everything. Our skin, our hair, our eyes, our nails, our organs, our muscles, our hormones, everything. I don't want that to be true, but it is. It really sucks, right? Especially if you love the taste. It's like every sip is doing a little bit of damage and over time, that damage just adds up. Now, let's get a little vain for a moment, shall we? Our skin. We all spend so much time and money trying to keep our skin looking youthful, but alcohol is like kryptonite on all that effort. I've always been a bit of a skincare junkie, I've got to admit. I love my serums, my moisturizers, my eye creams. I'm all about taking care of my skin because let's face it, we all want to look good and age well. But here's the thing, and this really bites. No amount of skincare can completely counteract the damage that alcohol does to our skin. You know, I used to think that as long as I was using great skincare products and eating well and drinking enough water, I could probably counteract any damage from even just an occasional glass of wine. But then I started noticing something. On the mornings, after I'd have even like one or two drinks, my skin just didn't look the same. It was duller, more dehydrated, and I had this puffiness around my eyes that just wouldn't go away. I chalked it up to getting older or not drinking enough water, but then I started reading more about how alcohol affects the skin, and it all started to make sense to me. For one thing, alcohol dehydrates the skin, causing it to look dull and aged, and it dilates blood vessels, which can make redness and conditions like rosacea even worse. Plus, as we age, our skin naturally loses collagen and elasticity, and alcohol speeds up that process, leading to more pronounced wrinkles and sagging. Who needs that? I used to think that drinking plenty of water would counteract these effects, but the truth is, it's just not that simple. Sure, hydration helps, but it can't completely reverse the damage that alcohol does. Unfortunately, there's more. Alcohol doesn't just mess with your sleep, your brain, and your skin. It's also terrible for your muscles and your bones, I've learned. In past videos, I've talked a lot about how as we age and estrogen decreases, our bones become more fragile. Well, alcohol only makes that worse because it interferes with bone density. This was another one of those aha moments for me. I've always been pretty active. I love to hike, ride my bike, go on long walks, I do yoga, I lift weights, but I started noticing that my recovery times were getting longer and I was feeling a little more sore than I used to. At first, I just thought it was part of getting older, but then I learned how alcohol can interfere with muscle recovery and increase soreness. It was like a light bulb went off. Here's how it works. Alcohol affects your body's ability to build and maintain muscle tissue. It interferes with protein synthesis, which is the process your body uses to repair and build muscle after a workout. And if that wasn't bad enough, alcohol also lowers your testosterone levels and increases cortisol, which is the stress hormone that can lead to muscle breakdown and increased fat storage, especially around the midsection. And you know what's even more frustrating? Cortisol also makes it harder to lose that stubborn belly fat that so many of us struggle with in midlife. And as we're aging, our body's ability to process toxins decreases too. Not fun to hear, I know, <laughs> but it's a fact. We don't metabolize alcohol and other toxins nearly as well as we did when we were younger. I don't know about you, but I found that when I drink alcohol, I just don't feel 100% the next day like I used to when I was younger. It's harder for our body to process it and get rid of it as we get older. Let's not forget about our gut and hormones. I've talked about gut health a lot on this channel because it's so important for our overall well-being, especially as we age. And guess what? Alcohol is a known gut irritant. Who knew? It kills both 
bad and good bacteria in our digestive system, which can lead to leaky gut syndrome and other digestive issues. If you've ever felt bloated or had digestive discomfort after just a few drinks, that's your gut telling you it ain't happy. And hormonally, alcohol disrupts the balance of estrogen and testosterone, which can lead to weight gain, especially around the middle, as I said, and an increase in cortisol, our stress hormone. This combination can make it nearly impossible to lose that stubborn midlife belly fat. I've talked about that recently too. And if you're like me, you're probably thinking, great, just what I needed. But it's true. Alcohol is a major contributor to hormone imbalances, and those imbalances can affect everything from our mood to our metabolism and even our ability to build muscle. Now, what about alcohol being carcinogenic? As I asked in the beginning, does alcohol really cause cancer? Is there any truth to that? I mean, as I asked, if it were true, wouldn't they have to put those labels on like they do for cigarettes and everything like that? It is a valid question, right? I mean, we've been warned over and over and over again to use clean skincare and hair care products and household products that don't contain parabens and phthalates and other toxins because there's a very slight chance of them causing cancer. So are we really increasing our risk of getting cancer for just having a couple of alcoholic beverages every week? And exactly how much is too much? Well, here's the hard truth. Alcohol is a known carcinogen, and it does increase the risk of various cancers, particularly breast cancer. There has been proposed to be a anywhere from four to 13% increase in risk of breast cancer for every 10 grams of alcohol consumed. How much is 10 grams? Well, in the US, one beer, which generally is 12 ounces, if it's in a bottle, one glass of wine or a shot of liquor tends to include about 10 to 12 grams of alcohol. What does this mean? Well, what we're talking about is that for every 10 grams of alcohol consumed, so that's one beer in the US, there's a four to 13% increase in risk of cancer. That's pretty outrageous, right? And you might think, wait, how could it be that you know, this stuff is even legal. A recent study showed that women who drink just two alcoholic beverages a day have a 74% higher chance of developing breast cancer compared to non-drinkers. That is a huge number, you guys. And it really made me stop and think about my own habits. I mean, when you get real with yourself, Okay, let's break it down. If you're averaging 14 drinks per week, and remember, the average person, when they're pouring themselves a glass of wine, is not the four or five ounces that is considered a serving. Most people at home actually are pouring themselves two servings. And at those restaurants where they ask you if you want a nine ounce or certainly a 12 ounce pour, you know what that looks like. So let's just say that on Friday night, you're drinking three of those big glasses. That's actually six servings. Then let's say you go to a party on Saturday and you have three more glasses and two more big glasses on Sunday. When it comes down to actual servings, you're getting 14 servings in just three days. You don't have to drink every day to rack up 14. And that puts you at a 74% higher risk of breast cancer. Again, I am not here to tell you what to do. I just wanna lay out the facts because if you're anything like me, you might've known alcohol wasn't great for you but it's easy to be in denial about something you like and enjoy, right? So I wanted to share this information because sometimes when we know better, we can actually do better. Maybe you need to cut back. Maybe you need to quit completely. I don't know. And I'm not the person to make that decision for you. But I am here to share what I've learned because it's so important to be aware of the facts and of the risks. So here's something I've tried. Last year, I decided to abstain from alcohol for the month of January, you know, dry January. It was hard, but the first two or three weeks were definitely the toughest, and then it got a little easier. And then on day 31, I realized, hey, I'm kind of on a roll here, let's do another month. And then on the last day of February, I thought, gosh, this actually isn't so bad. Let's see if I can make it 90 days. It was kind of like, you know, my own little competition with myself. And I kept going for six months. What made me start drinking wine again after that? Oh, it was the beginning of summer and you know, the vibe. I just really love the idea of having a nice glass of chilled rosé with my friends. That's honestly all it was. And I must admit, I really enjoy that. But I found that once you get in the habit again of drinking even just a little, 
For me, it's very hard to break. And since then, I've done a ton of research and I realized I don't want to age badly. I don't want to encourage joint pain, inflammation, and disease. I just turned 60 and I feel good about how I'm aging, but you know, I feel like I just turned 50 a few years ago. So not to be depressing, but 70 is gonna be here before I know it, whether I like it or not. And to a large extent, I have total control over how well or badly I age is mostly up to me. But when I got really honest with myself, I realized it's a slippery slope. It's unfortunately so easy to fall back into old habits. And that's what I did. So recently on my 60th birthday, one week ago, I celebrated with my family and a few close friends and we had wine and birthday cake, of course. If you've seen any of my videos on how I cut out added sugar 15 years ago, you'll know I do allow myself to indulge in a piece of birthday cake every year on my birthday. But that night on my birthday, I also decided that going forward, as I embark on my next decade, I'm gonna abstain from alcohol. I'm not necessarily saying forever. I don't actually like to ever say never, but I'm gonna do what I did in January last year. I'm gonna break it down. Start with 30 days and then do another 30 days and then another and then another. My goal is to abstain from alcohol for one full year. And then I'll assess the situation, my health, how I'm looking and feeling, and I'll take another look at it and see where I wanna go next. But if the six months I went alcohol-free last year is any indication, I can predict with pretty good certainty that I'm gonna feel 10 years younger with more energy physically and mentally. That's what happened when I went six months alcohol-free. I don't know, we'll see what happens. I'll give you updates here on the channel, so check back often. Oh, and by the way, if you're someone who thinks maybe you need or wanna take a break from alcohol and give your body a rest and maybe a cleanse of sorts by getting all those alcohol toxins out, or maybe you just wanna see what it feels like to go 30 days or even 60 days or 90 days alcohol-free and just examine your own relationship with it, and you don't wanna feel all alone in this experiment and maybe you want support and ideas and tools and a supportive community, well, let me know, comment below this video. Just say, I wanna do an alcohol-free challenge, no matter how long you wanna do it for. And I'll put something together for us and I'll let you know. Okay, thanks for watching Thrivers. I hope this video gave you some food for thought and maybe even inspired you to take a closer look at your own physical and mental health and to what extent, if any, you want alcohol in your own life. The truth is, how we treat our bodies today will shape how we age tomorrow. And if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that aging is a much happier journey if we've got optimal health, vitality, and brain power. So here's my challenge to you. Take control of your health and well-being by making a commitment to yourself, whether it's cutting back on alcohol, taking a break for 30 days, or just being more mindful of your habits. Let's do this together. If you're ready to make a change, even a small one, let me know in the comments below. Let's build a community of support where we empower each other to make choices that uplift us and sustain us. And if you're thinking, I need to take this a step further and you want more guidance, tips, and motivation, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. I'll be sharing more on my journey and I'd love for you to join me every step of the way. Remember, we have the power to shape our futures. No one else does but us. So let's make choices today that will help us thrive tomorrow. Together we can create a healthier, happier life, one decision at a time. You've got this, and I'm here to support you every step of the way. Until next time, stay vibrant, stay gorgeous, and keep thriving.